if you want to learn anything well, you look for a teacher who has mastered the subject you want to learn. Why should you think differently when it comes to your spiritual life? To find a way out of suffering, you must find a guide who has already found the way out and can show you how to do it yourself. To find a spiritual teacher is the most fundamental aspect of the Buddhist path. It is not possible to learn to be enlightened from books alone. You need a living teacher to personally guide you. Jaisong Kappa attained enlightenment and because of his great compassion gave teachings on the graduated path to enlightenment so others could be free. He taught the first step on the path is to devote yourself to a teacher who can properly guide you. In this program, we will learn how to recognize a perfectly qualified teacher and how rare it is to be able to take them as your guide. In the Mahayana Buddhist teachings, it is said that the spiritual mentor is the key to the path, a guide to the perfect and ultimate state of enlightenment. Therefore, one's motivation, both in seeking a spiritual teacher as well as in cultivating and developing a relationship with one, is of fundamental importance. In this program, we will explore together the importance of the spiritual teacher to achieving ultimate success on the spiritual path. Therefore, as you listen to these teachings, generate in your mind a particularly strong altruistic motivation, seeking to attain enlightenment as quickly as possible in order to bring to enlightenment all other living beings. In the context of um, engaging in a spiritual transformation, um, bringing about a change within one's hearts and minds, at the initial stage, we do need to rely upon experienced teacher who can show us the path, who can introduce us to the subject matter. Um, since the, the sort of the role of spiritual teacher in one's practice becomes so important. Uh, we find that in Lama Tsongkhapa's uh, great expositions of the stages of the path, he um, discusses the, the, the issue of uh, reliance on spiritual teacher. Um, the qualifications that are uh, necessary on the part of the teachers are presented in Maitreya's um, Mahayana Sutra Alamkara, the ornament of Mahayana Sutras, where he lists 10 principal uh, qualities or qualifications of a t spiritual teacher. Uh, the first is uh, someone with a disciplined mind. This refers to the quality of uh, having an ethical discipline. Second is having a calmed mind, which refers to the quality of having mastered the higher training in meditation and concentration. And the third is being thoroughly calmed, which refers to the quality of having mastered the higher training in wisdom, here particularly referring to the wisdom of no self, anatma, and then number four is that having the, the knowledge and, and the experience of the three higher trainings alone is not adequate. You need to have uh, the a knowledge that, is, that, is, um, that exceeds the knowledge of the students, whatever subject matter that is being taught. The teacher must have a knowledge that exceeds the, the, the level of the student's knowledge. So this is the fourth uh, quality. The fifth is that um, the teacher must have um, um, a vigor and enthusiasm for teaching uh, the student. And so this is the fifth one, that, that's enthusiasm. Number six is that the teacher must have a vast learning so that he or she will have the resources from where the teacher will be able to draw the metaphors, the examples, the citations, and all of this. 
Um, so vast learning is this number six. Number seven is um, who has the realization of emptiness. Um, if possible, the uh, uh, genuine realization of emptiness, if not at least having a deep um, um, commitment to the practice of compassion, sort of practice of emptiness on the basis of having uh, a, a deep admiration to the teachings of emptiness. And then number eight is that the teacher must be eloquent and skillful in his or her means of presenting the Dharma. Having knowledge and experience alone is not adequate. If the teacher is not skillful in presenting the Dharma, then the Dharma teaching would not be effective. So number eight is eloquent speech. Number nine is probably the most important quality here, having a deep compassion towards the student to whom the teaching is being given, uh, someone who has a genuine um, kind of sort of a concern for the well-being of the student. So this compassionate uh, mind is number nine. And number 10 is that the teacher should have the ability of resilience so that no matter how many times the teacher has to repeat um, in his or her teaching, uh, he or she should have the, the resilience to, to continue to maintain his or her enthusiasm, commitment to the student so that he or she is not discouraged or sort of, you know, becomes kind of uh, loses enthusiasm. So these are the 10 qualities recommended in uh, Maitreya's text. And then Tsongkhapa concludes that section by making a, uh, an emphasis that those practitioners who wish to seek a spiritual teacher should familiarize themselves with these qualities, qualifications of the spiritual master, and then search for these qualities in the person that who, in whom you wish to entrust. Such a thought may uh, come into your mind, well, do I really need to rely on a qualified guru in order to travel the path? There are so many books that are being translated around. I can just, uh, I can just take those books and study those books. And on the basis of that, I will be able to travel the path and achieve realization. This is a wrong conception. It's a mis mistaken uh, conception. Why? Because those teachings have been, are alive. The teachings are alive. They need to be alive in order to have the strength to, uh, of generating the realization in the mind of the one who practices it. That, that's why we have an, in, an interrupted lineage, which comes from Buddha Shakyamuni down to your root guru, which the teachings have been practiced, have been received, practiced, and passed to the next guru up to your root guru. So that is the meaning of possessing the blessing of the lineage. That is what makes it work in your mind. Just the book itself, it won't do it. First, you have to receive it from an alive guru. Mm -hmm. Whether the Lama possesses all the qualities or not, at least he possesses the qualities of having the blessing of the lineage, having received the blessing of the lineage, and the qualities of being, cap uh, being capable of passing through that particular lineage blessing, that is what makes it. So now thinking this way, because I want to achieve the supreme enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, I need a guru. I need someone who is able to show me the path, how to travel to this path in order to achieve the purpose that I have in my mind. So 
if I need even for worldly matters, for worldly education, someone who's, in, who's on the top of that particular knowledge, who's, who's able to show me how to get that particular knowledge, that much more I need a qualified guru who's able to show me the path to enlightenment. And uh, uh, not only I need, uh, I need a guru, I need a guru who is qualified, uh, perfectly qualified, and I need to rely on this perfectly qualified guru uh, in the correct way without reversing my devotion or without abandoning that reliance, because that very reliance is the root of all the goodness that I'm seeking for. to enlightenment. The most profound one, the fastest one, the quickest one, the swiftest one is devotion to spiritual guide. By correctly devoting to spiritual guide you can get enlightened in one lifetime. It is so powerful. I mean first you say what is a, what is a guru? Sarum Shaykh explained guru is someone who's heavy in qualities, nothing higher. So then why do we need a guru? And, and I, I kind of more or less said that, it's the root of the path. What are the reasons for this? Um, if you want to learn any kind of a skill, you need a teacher. And even a worldly skill, you need a teacher. So definitely the path to enlightenment, where we've never been before, where it's unknown to us. It, and in Lamsan Kappa's Lamrim Chemmo, there's a quote from one of the Kadampa Geshes that says, you know, here we are, we've just emerged from, from aeons spent in the lower realms, and we want to get enlightened, we want to travel the path, I mean, definitely we need a guide. Definitely we need a guide. So, um, whether or not you get the realizations, you know, um, how deeply you get those realizations, how stably you get those realizations, and um, <coughs> not, in fact, not just, in fact, it's explaining the teachings, not just the realizations, but they say whether or not your life becomes success or not. It depends on the, the, the strength of your devotion to spiritual guide. So it becomes a, it becomes a big thing. So this is the first thing that we have to become convinced of, that we <coughs> definitely need a qualified teacher in order to travel the path to enlightenment. Okay? Even if we were going to go to India, we would need a guide. We need it because the goal is not just intellectual, it's to transform the mind. I think that's, that's fine, that's clear. So you need a guru who can teach the whole path, right? You need a guru, you need a perfectly qualified guru who can teach you the whole path, and you need to devote yourself correctly. And it's kind of like that. You have some hardship to get your guru, and you really check. Once you've got them, you know, you're going to be completely, okay, this one I'm going to devote, and I'm going to devote really well. Now, what are the benefits of correctly devoting? So, um, now we come to these eight benefits. And the point is that if you think about these benefits, then this amazing energy is going to come and your practice is going to burst out because you want to do nothing but devote yourself. You really want to devote yourself to your guru and you want to do it in a very good way. When I first heard about guru devotion, I wasn't very attracted to it. I, I thought it sounded a bit cult-like. And also I was used to 
um, having one God that was above everything else. And to think that a person with God-like qualities could be in a human form, a guru in a human form, you know, I just only kind of thought of uh, cults and maybe I'd find a wrong guru that would lead me down a wrong track. But then as I was involved with Buddhism, with Tibetan Buddhism, and I started seeing the Lama's qualities, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, and at first you're not sure and you find some qualities and then you have to open your heart and then you start to feel some devotion. And then through this devotion you see how Guru devotion, the teaching says, the root of the path and you need teachers to guide you and to inspire you and to protect you and the way they protect you is not some kind of magical powers necessarily although there is this blessing power that does come with devotion but it's more like they protect you by teaching you the Dharma and therefore through your own actions you protect your you learn to train your mind which protects your mind then you start thinking I don't want to start I, I want to react less with anger and I want to practice patience and you get inspired through their example and you get guidance through they will tell you if you know if you request and you know and then if you have the karma to receive advice and hopefully if you you know you practice dharma and eventually you create the good fortune to be able to receive direct advice on an individual basis from your teacher and because our gurus have more wisdom than we do they can see more appropriately the best practice for us to help us because their only aim is to want to help us lead us to enlightenment so their advice is always with this wanting to lead us to enlightenment and how to do this in the most effective way. So we can follow their advice with great assurance that it is coming from the most pure place. And therefore, if we follow their advice purely, we are going to progress towards enlightenment. I left school and home when I was 15 took a quite a lot of drugs after I left home and I was partying all the time and I was pretty much almost, I mean I didn't like live on the streets but I was just hanging out on the streets for about a year and I met Rinpoche for the first time so this is probably, this is probably the sweet part of my life. It was just like there is no question in my life and that the only thing that I want to do is offer my life to Rinpoche and it was very, very, very strong. I mean you just watch Rinpoche and you know, you just watch Rinpoche for like every single act he does is, is you know, an act is, is so perfect. And you know, you just want to be like that. You just know that, that this, is what, this is what you want to do. And I just knew like 100% if I offered myself to, you know, this being that he would direct me in a way that would, that would be useful because I can't figure it out myself. I mean, or because I have so many past imprints that's making me, um, you know, continually making me think, you know, continually making me believe that samsara is going to bring me happiness, you know, and that it's going to work if I, you know, fall in love again. It's, this time it's going to work, it's going to give me happiness or whatever. I just 100% trusted that Rinpoche could definitely direct my life and guide me and show me how to do it. I mean, especially looking at Rinpoche as as the guru, as the yidam, as the Buddha, then definitely, I mean, there's nothing higher than that. We don't have anything higher than that, and there's, there's nothing more precious to do. And it's not like, okay, once, once you have a relationship with the guru, then it's like, it's really easy after that. It's, in fact, it's even more difficult because Rinpoche confronts, I mean, ultimately he confronts your ego. So that is a really painful experience, very, very painful, because it's the one thing that we protect very well. So I'm, I'm still trying to deal with that and I'm amazed at how um, Rinpoche cuts my ego down. Like every time I'm in front of him, you know, every time he's very subtly, very individually, you know, he's like, he's basically taming my mind and it's, it's very precious. Um, just to see Rinpoche, especially now I've been, 
you know, able to serve Rinpoche quite closely for like nearly, nearly three years. And there's, you know, it just is reconfirmed in my life that, you know, it's unbelievable, perfect. Rinpoche's actions are amazing. His, everything he does comes from bodhicitta, you know, he's always trying to help people. I just pray that I can keep being able to serve Rinpoche in doing this because it feels really good. La la ma sa ye la ma His Holiness is one of his names is the presence, you know, Kundan, you know, so that there's something you can experience uh, that makes you believe that it's possible because you see examples of persons. So I, by meeting Lama Yeshi and Lama Zoprapache and Keshe Dargi and His Holiness Dalai Lama and other teachers. Uh, they're human beings, and they're saying, uh, "This is how Bo Lord Buddha said. This is how it is. I practiced it. I think this is how it is. If you practice it, it can be that way for you." So even if they all deny they have any realization or any power of mind, you know, anything they would say, "Oh, I'm not special. As long as I'm, I'm just a simple monk." You know? If you spend any time with him, any time near him, there's an effect he has on your mind that isn't just based on uh, his intellectual understanding of Buddhism. There's an effect you can experience by being near a realized teacher that affects your own mind. So now we take a, we can imagine maybe, a being like His Holiness the Dalai Lama or Lama Yeshi, Lama Zopa, Keshe Darga, who actually removed all the afflictions. The mind has these qualities of love, compassion, wisdom. So that has a that can have a profound effect on your mind just by being near them. So for me, that's what gave me the besides my own little experiments with meditation and practice and seeing what effect I could have in my mind, being near people who obviously to me, you know, even though they deny it, have done it, you know. So they've done it. So if they've done it, they're human beings. I'm a human being. I did this practice. Lord Buddha said you're a human being, you can do this practice and you can remove the afflictions. So what so that's what I think uh, having had the good fortune to be near those beings and at the same time try to put it into some small way to practice. So the combination of those two experiences, uh, so for me there's no doubt, you know, spending some time with Lama Yeshi and Lama Zoparavisha, being near His Holiness. I mean His Holiness is just amazing. I saw this film I think in Los Angeles. He was going to meet the press corps, you know, the hardened reporters who think everything is, you know, basically bad, I think, anyway. So just as he went down the line touching them, they sort of lit up like light bulbs. You know? Just as he passed, everyone became momentarily happy that their cares went away. They were smiling. It may be 30 seconds later, it was gone, or 10 minutes later, it was gone. But it has an effect. So then we, I mean, so I think the idea of the blessings of the Lama the blessings of the Guru, the blessings of the Buddha. It doesn't have to be so mystical. You put the big magnet next to the small magnet, so the polarities come the same for a little bit till, you, till the big magnet moves away, you know. So you see some possibility, you know, the blessings of the Guru, the blessings of the teacher. So in the, and within Buddhism, I think, so that's the key, you know, you can have a qualified teacher and then follow an authentic, qualified teaching. And then you make the experiment yourself. And if it works, you do it more. If it doesn't work, do something else.